I'm leaving home for the coastline Someplace under the sun I feel my heart for the first time So how was the day? Everybody's looking pretty good Ah, very good, good smiles I was starting, starting to come What about you? Oh, come on <laughs> Okay, so what is it gonna be tonight? Can you read my mind? Not yet? Oh, that's boring <laughs> You know, for me on my spiritual journey um, I've tried so many things and um, one of the big insights that I had is uh, trying medit many different meditation practices was that some some meditation practice meditation practices lead in different places and so it's really interesting to be aware and know all the things that you can do with your mind. It's quite, it's quite amazing. And since I've tried quite a lot of different meditation techniques, I also noticed that um, they were all designed to make different things with the mind, basically. And when I started to be more interested in, in the Buddha's teaching, because when I started reading the discourses of the Buddha, because we still have those today, a lot of faith arose. <laughs> I'm like speaking like the canon, basically. A lot of faith arose in me. <laughs> and a tremendous faith, actually, because I was really impressed by the Buddha's words. But the way that I was practicing then, I couldn't relate when I was reading the discourses of the Buddha because um, my meditation practice was very different. It felt like when I was reading the suttas, the discourses of the Buddha, uh, the Buddha was talking about something else, <laughs> which I didn't seem to quite be able to understand or to experience. He was talking about these meditative states that he called the jhanas quite a bit and my teachers were telling me be be afraid of these things don't don't go close to these things don't be attached to these things don't be attached to the joy and then I was reading the Buddha talking about joy all the time and happiness and ease and I was wondering what's what's going on with that and I was ta reading about mental states and the the Buddha kept talking about these mental states and their importance and different kinds of mental states like we discussed yesterday. And so on my, on my journey uh, trying, um, I tried uh, all different kinds of vipassana practices, different kinds of uh, one-pointed focused awareness, absorption, concentration, uh, and uh, Other things that I've practiced were um, even uh, sweat lodge ceremonies, which sound, which sound crazy. It sounds ridiculous. Why would I even talk about this? And actually, it turns out that these sweat lodge ceremonies <laughs> in Mexico were uh, quite profound. It's funny because I, I mentioned that to somebody at the, in California that, you know, I went to Mexico for like on my spiritual journey and when you say that people kind of look at you like hmm <laughs> because usually people think of like peyote and things like that <laughs> and uh, basically hallucinogenics and things like that but don't worry that was not my experience uh, it was just pure heat and uh, actually the medicine man I uh, learned from and spent time with he was a herbologist and he would make this huge barrel of a tea there was like 15 different kinds of plants in there and he would just cook them up it was like camphor peppermint you know 
harmless plants, and just really healthy plants. And we would go into the sweat lodge and that's what we would pour on the rocks. So it, we would just like soak in that uh, for a really long time. And I would do these things for a really long time, like three, four hours, even doing yoga in there. And it's really interesting when, uh, what happens in there is that it's so hot, even thinking becomes unbearable. You can't, you can't allow yourself to think anymore because it's just taking that, uh, that energy in the mind that is just too much already. Your mind has to let go of everything. After two and a half, three, four hours, uh, the mind has to completely let go of every, everything. It cannot think anymore because it's too much. Just the thought it weighs like crazy it's too much to bear with and I actually came out of these sweat lodges ceremonies and my my mind was clearer than after a 10-day Vipassana course uh, and I was really amazed at what these these things these practices were able to cleanse my mind how it was able to actually purify my mind and it would last for quite a while but the thing is, because this is a kind of a art artificially done to the mind, it doesn't last for very long, and it's not based on wisdom, and it's not based on the wisdom of the Buddha, the discernment of, that the Buddha is talking about. And so this discourse tonight is about just that, a little bit more about what is this, the core awakening of the Buddha regarding wholesome states and unwholesome states. And we've already touched upon that yesterday. And this is one of my favorite stories in the canon uh, because it's just a lovely, a, a lovely s story, the way that it's rolled out. And uh, it's, this is Majjhimanikaya 19, the two kinds of thoughts. And I really like that the Buddha is it he rarely says he rarely begins by when I was a Bodhisattva still unenlightened on my quest for enlightenment uh, here's what I did and so there's only a few specific places in the canon in the text where we find these instances where he relates his quest before enlightenment and he shares a basically a nugget, a part of his enlightenment to us. And so this is what this discourse is. So before my complete awakening, monks, while I was a bodhisattva, anybody here has any idea except the front row and maybe the Sri Lankan part, <laughs> what a bodhisattva is. <laughs> okay, so it's basically just somebody that's in, in the search for uh, awakening. S somebody that's not fully awakened yet or uh, usually it more specifically towards a future Buddha. One, and a Buddha is someone who discovers uh, awakening on his own. We are lucky, we get a Buddha to tell us, you know, here's what to do. But the Buddha don't have a Buddha to tell them <laughs> so they actually have to try a lot of things to figure it out and so that's why they're called the Buddha because they they're a very special being and so while I was only a bodhisattva not yet fully awakened I reflected let me meditate discerning and dividing my thoughts into two categories so already that's an interesting an interesting beginning Has it a ever happened to you before to just think, sitting on your bed, hmm, let me just divide my thoughts into two? <laughs> Not me, anyways. <laughs> From then on, monks, I gathered on one side thoughts of sensory desire, anger or impatience, and restlessness. 
usually this is harm or um, violence, but I use restlessness in this case because it's very close. The restless mind is kind of always agitated and it's kind of violent in its, in, in its own way, in a, in a gentle kind of way. <laughs> but it's, it pertains more to our direct meditation practice. And I gathered on the other side thoughts of letting go, nikkama, thoughts of non-anger, abhyapara, and thoughts of contentment or calm, basically the opposite of restlessness. And so I'd like to ask the audience, so what was your preliminary distraction today? Primary distraction? Primary, what did I say? Preliminary, you know, that's not the word. <laughs> Primary. Primary distraction. Or was there like a theme that reoccurred today? Like maybe sometimes it's kind of like some kind of anxiety. I'll, I'll start. So basically, um, I think for me was restlessness had a little bit of restlessness today because because teaching retreats is not like sitting a retreat and so you have things to think about and what am I going to talk about tonight and uh, how am I going to say it um, and then thinking what, what sutta what will I share what what is the most relevant topic for tonight and so on this, the mind gets kind of like a little bit active, and that's what I, I experienced today. But that's an example. I'd like to hear from you. That was not meant to be about me. Exciting. Excitement. Excitement. Agitation. It's very close to restlessness. Exciting. Good, good, that's a good one. I'd like to hear it from everybody actually. Yes. So we can share a little bit what happened for us today. We, we, that doesn't have to be in an order, you can think about it more. Uh, you're talking about like the biggest um, negative distraction, right? uh, the biggest Yeah, the main highlight, yeah. I would say self doubt. Self doubt. Uh -huh. like, uh, the king hindrance. Yeah, because the other ones uh, bring it with them, and yes. it also brings other hindrances with it. Yes, yeah, the king hindrance of doubt, which brings all the other distractions along along its path. <laughs> Restlessness and ah, oh, well, I can't meditate. I might as well go for a chocolate sundae, <laughs> and then. Darn, there's no chocolate sundaes around. <laughs> and then anger arises. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that, that's a good one. Craving for progress and meditation. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I mean, this is, uh, the, more, the more we meditate, the more we make progress on the path, usually, the more this is the main hindrance basically is trying to get somewhere you've been because you know how it is and just it takes time and it's not there so uh, did you think about yours the, uh, planning, restless mind. planning planning restless mind that's close to mine <laughs> yeah good yeah. Then second row, or anybody. Impatience. Impatience. Oh, impatience. Okay. Yes. Yes. Very good. That's usually how I translate anger, actually, because anger is is a word used in the text or like um, aversion, but. I find that the most common way that it manifests in us all the time is like that impatience. It's like this. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Lin. 
anticipation, looking forward to something that's not here. Is it? Some, uh, yes, good, good. Sham. <laughs> okay, so what would that fall into? Hmm. Maybe restlessness? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> good, good. What about our Scandinavian crowd? Yes. Self doubt. Self doubt, yes. Why? You're doing so great. <laughs> Restlessness? Is that? Yes, yes. Very common one, yes. It all, I think it all kind of culminates into that restlessness. Huh? Like any, any uh, little distraction, it's just, that's what it does. It, like it does this with the mind. Maybe our, our Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan audience. Sloth and Torpor. Okay, good, good. Well, good. <laughs> you don't look like you were uh, you were dozing off or anything. It was like bright smiling, all good. Good. Is that is it a common hindrance amongst Sri Lankans? What about the other people? Yes. Same. Okay, we got two out of five. Let's see. Kokila. Piti. Anxious. Yes. Anxiety. Yes. 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 Uh huh. Anxiety. Very close to restlessness. Yes. Uh huh. Good. And at the back is that Ranjani. Oh, no hindrance today. We got a winner. <laughs> what about Vajira? Good. Well, okay. Great. Thank you all. Uh, oh, there's Flo. Same thing. Same thing. Staying in the mind. Uh huh. Too much energy. Ah, uh, yes, restlessness, kind of. Okay, yeah, good. I just wanted to go through everybody's actual experience and relate it to these terms because sometimes they just relate, they just remain kind of alien to our practice. But when we actually uh, can say, like, uh, if, if you wanted something, for example, like you're thinking of the beach, maybe, or like how you'd like to be at the beach, well, that's kind of like uh, wanting for some kind of sensory thing. So that's the first one. Or like the, the impatience in terms of, uh, you know, it's not always full-fledged anger. That's not always something that we can bring home to our practice, but impatience is quite manageable. We can actually, we can actually see impatience quite, quite well in, in a lot of ways. When you're it's been 20 minutes or 40 minutes and then you just want to like stand up and stop meditating and then you can see at the mind in the mind just before that happens what is there it's a little bit of impatience and then that is what it's like a spring it's like whoop and then people stand up and then they break their sitting so and restlessness is kind of like the like the overseer of everything is kind of like everything culminates into restlessness and it also feeds uh, these these uh, these states and what have we been practicing today just as a counter 
counterexample of that. Feeling starts with an L. <laughs> Love. Loving kindness, yes. For your spiritual friend. So that would be in the category of non-anger. That's what that means. Uh, non-anger is loving kindness, compassion, joy. And uh, thoughts of wanting things. Then what is the opposite of that that we are practicing? Um, it starts with, there's, there's six of them. There's six. And they all start with our... <laughs> What's the answer? <laughs> yeah. So the release and relax, that's the letting go. That's the nikama. So what we are practicing, you can actually see here and now. It's, it's in there. It's right there. It's, we're not making this up. It's just that... Uh, we need to know these things for, for us to uh, understand that th these are meditation instructions that the Buddha is giving. It's not just uh, you know fixing your awareness on something, it's actually developing wholesome states of mind which culminate into liberation, collectedness and samadhi. Then while I was meditating attentive, intent and resolute there arose thoughts of sensory desires or just wanting something, wanting something that is not here. Then I reflected, this is troublesome. This is troublesome to others and this is troublesome to both. These thoughts impede conscious discernment. They come with tension in the mind and they lead away from peace. So when a thought that arises in the mind about, oh, I want to be at the beach, or oh, I, I'd like to be there or do this, then is the mind actually content? Is it actually happy, peaceful? Not really. It's, it's kind of moving out. It's kind of flowing out. That's why we call it asava, because it flows out. And it flows out and that flow is kind of making movement, it's agitating the mind. And the more we feed into that, the more the mind becomes agitated with every uh, thoughts like this. And the Buddha actually says it here, it comes with tension in the mind. It's not, it's not, it's not a liberated, happy, free state. And so as soon as I realize this is troublesome, they faded away. So as soon as we realize, we see the tension and we, we can feel it as it is, tension. When we say tension in this practice, it's just a sneaky way to talk about the Four Noble Truths. Like tension is basically just dukkha. And when you see it, it's easy to release it. And so that is tremendously profound. This is very important on, in our practice to understand this. So that's why today on interviews I put a lot of emphasis on asking everybody, do you feel the tension when your mind gets distracted? Did everybody feel the tension? I know most people did, yes. Either in the head or on the shoulders, neck. But every time the mind gets distracted, there is tension. There is a kind of clenching that happens. And so as soon as we realize this, that it's troublesome, that there is tension, then we actually, it's easy for us to just move out, release and relax that, apply the six R's. So I kept letting go thoughts of sensory desire of, or just wanting things that are not here now as they arose. I kept on releasing them and bringing them to an end. So this is what we're doing. Every time you have a distraction, you apply the six R's, you release with wisdom, with the wisdom of the Buddha, seeing this is tension, this is the Four Noble Truths. This is tension, this is the distraction that is the cause of the tension. And then seeing the release from it, the relax, the release and relax step, and then continually doing that path is the path, basically. These are the Four Noble Truths.
And then, so for you, for those of you who are familiar with the suttas, uh, it's very, very, very repetitive. So, um, the Buddha will go through this sequence, the same sequence that I went through for the remaining two states, which is anger and restlessness. But I will just skip over that, and so that we can make some progress here. And so as we do this, we understand with wisdom, we see that there is tension when the mind gets distracted, we six R, and then we continually do this, uh, then we get to recondition the mind. And so the Buddha says now, whatever one frequently thinks about and reflects upon over and over again, this becomes the inclination of one's mind. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of sensory desires, or wanting things, that person has left the thought of letting go, of relaxing, to, cult to cultivate thoughts of sensory desires or just wanting something that is not here. Their mind is bent upon wanting. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of anger, that person has left the thought of non-anger or of love, loving kindness, to cultivate the thoughts of anger. Who would want to be doing that? <laughs> Their mind is bent upon anger. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of restlessness, that is another word for anxiety, stress, um, all of these beautiful contemporary mental challenges. That person has left the thought of calm and contentment to cultivate thoughts of restlessness. Their mind is bent upon restlessness. Yes? Does fear fall into that? Fear. 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 Yeah, so basically, you know, uh, these hindrances, they all kind of, they, they gang up, you know? So they, they always come together kind of thing. But um, fear could be placed in there and it could also be placed aside. Sometimes the Buddha will just have another one that is actually just fear, basically. So, yeah. And fear is a cocktail, is a cocktail of not wanting something because obviously, you know, uh, let's say you're walking uh, at the nighttime. Let's say, for example, when I was in uh, in Tenna at our monastery, and I'm walking back to my kuti. It's 20 minute walk in the forest, and it's dark, and I know there's elephants around. And uh, well, you can hear something in the bushes and some scratching, and and elephants are actually really sneaky. You can, you can hear them walking and they're really walking mindfully. They're really kind of, it's amazing. They're so big, but yet they are extremely mindful with every step and they're uh, conscious of not breaking leaves or breaking branches and making sound. And they're moving uh, in the forest at night. So it's, it's easy not to see them. There's a lot of stories about that. And then you get this kind of, you hear this ruffling in the, in the bushes and then this heart starts beating and basically you just, part of you is not wanting that experience. <laughs> it's just not, not being okay with it. <laughs> but there's also a little twang to, to that. It's not just that. There's also a part that is like, it's a special, fear is kind of a special flavor in itself as well. So. There's, and there is restlessness in there for sure. And so here, this is the beauty where the Buddha is really breaking these two states apart where on one side you have really um, wanting things, uh, not wanting things, pushing away and then being agitated. And these are, and then on the other side you have letting go you, uh, that that um, quality of you know stepping out, uh, relinquishing, and 
loving kindness or non anger, compassion, and then calm, composure, contentment. And these are complete opposite. And this is really important for us to understand. When we practice meditation, uh, when there's love in the heart, there's no anger. <laughs> anger cannot be. If love is there, anger cannot be. So it's, it's really making things very clear for us. So that's very helpful. Just as in the last month of the monsoon season, in the late fall, when the crops are abundant, when the crops are just mature and ready to be harvested, a cow herd would have to protect his cows, to keep his cows. To do so, he would have to poke and push, pull and block his cows in line, this way and that way, with a stick. Why? Because he sees that as the leader of these cows, he could be punished, imprisoned, fined or blamed for letting those cows just graze unconsciously at everything. In the same way, monks, I saw danger, degradation, and defilement in unwholesome mental states. And in wholesome mental states, I saw freedom, benefit, and, the natu and natural clarity. So I really like this analogy of the Buddha. He's talking about, you know, the, the cows is, is the mind. <laughs> This is our mind. All the cows are all of our mental states. And when we do not understand this wisdom, we have to, when we don't understand the nature of states, then we have to control our mind. We have to push it and poke it and control it and make it go this way or that way. And that's demanding, that's very demanding. Uh, like I was saying uh, in the previous retreat, I, I used to uh, be a long-time server at the Vipassana Center in Montreal. And uh, I, would, I would try to keep this kind of awareness going, the, the awareness that is kind of taking an object all the time, or just like trying to be aware of everything all the time kind of thing. A little bit like the noting, the noting uh, kind of meditations. And I remember uh, just being like in the kitchen and I was kitchen manager and I had a lot of things to do. We were cooking for 200 people and so we were a very active kitchen. And um, I would be like, I remember myself cleaning the dishes and just like trying to be aware of, you know, of my like scrubbing the dishes and not knowing for me. <laughs> not knowing the wisdom of wholesome states, I felt like I had to always block and push my mind and poke my mind in that direction all the time. And whenever there was a distraction or a hindrance outside, I would have to kind of block it off and shut it off. And this is very demanding. It's, it's difficult to do and it's not very sustainable. And the more we do this, the more we need to be controlling, the more we need to push and control and block and pull. Whereas when we understand the nature of wholesome states, we don't need to do that. And that's going to be the next. Uh... Then when I was meditating attentive, ardent, and intent and resolute, there arose thoughts of letting go in my mind. Then I reflected, this is not troublesome. This is not troublesome to others and this is not troublesome to either. These thoughts are for the growth of conscious discernment. They bring no tension in the mind and they lead to peace. So as we did that little exercise yesterday, uh, comparing how does it feel, how does anger feel inside of us and how does love feel inside of us, they're very different and one is very uh, Love is very, these wholesome states are liberating, they're open, uh, they're free, and they come with no tension in the mind. So this is really important to, to understand. This is what supports this whole meditation. Then I reflected, if I were to think and dwell 
upon these thoughts day and night. I see nothing to fear that could arise from this. And so there's, there's, these states are blameless. Whatever will happen, if our mind is wholesome, these, these states are blameless. And so there's nothing to fear. So when the mind is only dwelling in wholesome states, there's no fear that can arise. We're protected. But there's a little tweak here. Then I reflected, if I were to think and reflect constantly, before long, my body would become exhausted. With an exhausted body, the mind is unsettled. An unsettled mind is far from collected mental harmony, so samadhi. So this is like the reverse sequence that we recite every morning on natural collectedness. So basically, if we were to think about letting go all the time, if we were to basically use the six R's continually, try to do the six R's and think the six R's away, we're actually not using the six R's properly. And we would be creating a hindrance for ourselves. Because even though we would think like, uh, oh, let me relax, let me relax, let me relax, let I'm gonna relax, oh, I'm go just, I'm relaxing. This is relaxing, I'm relaxing. Now I'm really relaxed, now I'm, I'm really, really relaxing all the time, relaxing, relaxing. Well, actually the mind doesn't get to relax deeper. So to think about these states, like loving kindness, for example, oh, uh, it's the same thing with the spiritual friend or sentences, we only use them to bring up the feeling, but once the feeling is there, we don't need to keep activating the mind. We just say, may you be happy, may you be peaceful and calm. And then if I were to say, May you be happy, may you be happy, may you be happy, may you be happy, may you be happy. After two hours, <laughs> that would be pretty strenuous. So see here, that's the contrast. So we, not only do we want to cultivate these wholesome thoughts, but we also want to allow the mind to calm down and to, for these states to reach their full maturity, which is much more calm. So not activating the mind by thinking all the time. I then combed my mind and gathered it on itself. I unified it and brought it to collected mental harmony. Why? So that my mind be undistracted. So see, even though it's, it's a wholesome state, if we keep kind of churning our minds about it, it still becomes a distraction. It's a better one than the previous ones but it's still, it can go deeper. And I like this particular sutta because the Buddha he kind of highlights this very important part of the practice where it's not only about cultivating the metta and repeating phrases, it's actually also letting go of the phrases. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the traditional way loving kindness is being taught right now, nowadays, but it's constantly saying, repeating things, may all beings in the front direction, may all devas, may all non-humans, may all yada 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 all of these things and we keep thinking, thinking, thinking but the mind doesn't get to actually settle down and experience a more mature loving kindness so this is very important in this practice and the Buddha explains it very well here Whatever one frequently thinks about and reflects upon over and over again, this becomes the inclination of one's mind. And see, now we're slowly starting to talk about how the mind works. And this is a process that is called dependent origination, paticca samuppada, which we will start to break down a little bit more every time because this is just the structure of the mind and how it operates how we condition our mind the way that it does. So like when the mind gets distracted today, where does that dis distraction come from? How does it arise? Why, why, why can't you say, can, can you say to your mind, I want to uh, stop thinking completely here and now? How long is that gonna last? Maybe a few seconds? 
But why why can the mind not think? If you if you tell it not to think, why can it not think? Or can you tell your mind, I want to experience Nibbana now? Niroda Samapati. Now. It doesn't work like that. Because the mind is trained in another way. It's trained to think. It's trained to be active. And so the way that we train our mind is the way that it's going to come back to us also. So usually the hindrances, the distractions that we get is the way that we've conditioned our minds to be, usually. And this is a principle that is called neuroplasticity in neuroscience, but I'm not the professional. <laughs> and I actually liked, uh, I also like that, that phrase that um, neurons that fire together, uh, wire together. So, basically, the way that we train our minds to think, this is what will, like the neural pathways will become uh, stronger and more connected in, in these states. So if we develop loving kindness, then slowly we're creating pathways, and even science is explaining this with neuroplasticity, where uh, we have a choice, actually, we have a choice to cultivate these things and to create stronger pathways in our brain. Uh, and then you will notice that what you've been training to do becomes more natural. It becomes more uh, like a second nature for you to r respond with loving kindness instead of uh, anxiety, for example, or whatever it is happens to be. If a person frequently think, thinks and dwells in thoughts of letting go, that person has left the thoughts of, des of wanting desires to cultivate thoughts of letting go. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of non-anger, loving-kindness, that person has left the thought of anger or impatience to cultivate thoughts of loving kindness. If a person frequently thinks and dwells in thoughts of calm, that person is left thoughts of restlessness. To cultivate thoughts of calm, contentment. Just as in the last month of the summer season, when all the crops have been harvested in the villages, now this is the opposite scenario of earlier. A cowherd would keep an eye a cowherd would keep an eye on his cows at the root of a tree in the open only needing to be aware there are the cows. And so this is the same thing with wholesome states when there's only wholesome states in the mind it's blameless. It doesn't matter, nothing wrong can happen. And like this, not only are we protected, but we can just, uh, I think this is also a beautiful simile for Samadhi, that the way that it works, the, the cow herd can actually take a break and he's just sitting at a root of a tree and just like seeing like, there are the cows. The cow herd is not agitated, doesn't have to do anything about it. It's, it's by nature, the field is empty. The cows can roam. The cows can roam about without uh, making any kind of problems. And so this is a, a beautiful analogy for uh, the samadhi, the kind of samadhi that is practiced here. So, in the same way, monks, I only needed to be aware there are wholesome mental states. So this ties it up. Now, unrelenting, uncurbed my effort was. Unconfused presence of mind came to be. My body became calm and free of tension. My mind became collected and harmonious. And just so you know, the first section of this sutta was about Dhamma Vichaya, which is like investigation or right effort. That was the Buddha's explanation of right effort. And of course you need awareness for that and then flowing into virya so um, 
uncurb my effort was basically just continually practicing when you're practicing on this retreat continually being devoted to loving kindness not stopping when you're standing up when you're walking around when you're going for uh, a nature walk in the boulders with Bhante uh, when you're going for a swim just keeping loving kindness continually that is the effort the effort is not like like this the effort is to be continual to be persevering to continually do this over and over again letting go of all sensory engagement and letting go of unwholesome mental states still attended by thinking and reflecting and this is kind of tying up to what we just discussed with the blissful happiness born of letting go and here comes the PT so this is the fourth awakening factor I talked about the three previous ones and this is the fourth PT arises and that is a factor of the first level of meditation I understood and abided in the first level of meditation so as we let go of hindrances so these are all basically distractions then joy arises and we just had a pretty big breakdown at the beginning on just these two lines with the calming of thinking and reflection with inner tranquilization this is Pasadi this is the fifth now uh, support of awakening my mind became unified without thinking nor reflection and see now here we're moving away from the activity of the mind the Bhutaka Vichara even if it's wholesome then we also have to let go of the thinking about it just experiencing it feeling it goes much deeper with the blissful happiness born of collectedness uh, Samadhi the sixth awakening support I understood and abided in the second level of meditation with the calming of excited joy or stronger joy I abided in mental steadiness upekka that is the seventh present and fully aware experiencing happiness within my body a state which the awakened ones describe as steady presence of mind this is a pleasant abiding this is where that joy that beautiful joy will start to merge into a very calm poise steadiness of mind and this is just the beginning and the next level of meditation it kind of culminates into a very strong uh, balance of mind I understood and abided in the third level of meditation then unattached to pleasant experiences unsteered by unpleasant ones as mental excitement and heaviness these two extremes of the mind kind of dissolve and merge one's mind is balanced purified by unmoving presence this is upekka I understood and abided in the fourth level of meditation so these levels of meditation are a quite uh, very usual sequence that the Buddha used they're probably one of the most uh, common sequence found in the canon to describe this meditation and so as we practice the six R's and mental uh, development with loving-kindness right effort and um, letting go of unwholesome states naturally the mind will go through this process of uh, basically liberation in, uh, in other places the Buddha calls these uh, meditation states these stages he calls them temporary liberations of the mind because we are clearing cleaning our minds and they're going through these stages of liberation more and more and when we kind of when we stop or when the experience becomes a little bit coarser then you know we we kind of drift away from those so they are temporary but they are the way they are still the way of training that will bring us 
uh, what he calls the unshakable releases, the unshakable liberations. With this composed and collected mind, wholly cleansed and purified, clear and open, rid of imperfections, having become pliant and malleable, straight and unwavering, I directed and inclined my mind to the complete calming of mental movements, the asavakaya. I directed and inclined my mind. I understood mental movements as they really are. This is tension. This is the increase of tension. This is the release from tension. This is how to release the tension. Is there anybody here that could tell me what, what, this, what is this sequence, these four lines? What is this sequence about? The Four Noble Truths, yes. So it, it's always about applying that template. It's always about applying that template. And the six R's is another way of understanding that template. I understood mental movements as they really are. These are the distractions this is the increase of distractions. This is the release from distractions. And this is how to release the distractions. So these are just ways to understand what is happening for us in the mind. Continually observing and understanding in this way, my mind was released from the inclination from clinging outwardly, from the inclination of projecting in the future, from the inclination of to negligence, carelessness. In that release, I knew this is release. I directly knew unwholesome states have been overcome. Lived is the spiritual life. Done is what had to be done. There is no more conceit here. So that is what happens at the very end. <laughs> Just so you have an idea, maybe a glimpse of, you know, what that liberation that the Buddha tapped into felt like. And now there's a beautiful uh, little analogy at the end to, to summarize uh, the story of the Buddha. Just as if there was in a remote forest a vast and extensive marsh on low-laying grounds where would live and forage a great deer colony. You can actually see some deers around here. Uh, there's quite a few. Then some man would come intent on their ruin, intent on their harm, intent on capturing them. He would cover up the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And he would open the deceptive path, set down a groom decoy, and bring up a domestic lure. Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to ruin and decline. Then some men would come intent on their happiness, intent on their welfare, intent on their liberation. He would clear up and reveal the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And he would cover up the deceptive path release the decoy and remove the lure. Because of this, after some time, the great deer colony would be brought to growth, prosperity and abundance. This story I just told you, monks, is to teach a lesson. Here is the meaning. The vast and extensive marsh on low grounds, this is a designation for all sensory desires. The great deer colony, this is a designation for all living beings. The man intent on their ruin, harm and capture, this is a designation for Mara and wickedness. The deceptive path is a designation for the unwise eight-spoke path. That is, unwise understanding, unwise thoughts, unwise speech, unwise behavior, unwise living, unwise practice, unwise awareness, and unwise meditation. 
The decoy, this is a designation for the happiness of craving because there is a kind of happiness that comes from it. But this is a very poor investment. It can be taken away at any time. And it doesn't come from us, it comes from outside. The, and the lure, this is a designation for lack of conscious discernment. The man intent on their happiness, welfare and liberation, this is the designation for the Buddha, the Tathagata, the truth finder worthy and perfectly all awakened the safe and free path to be traveled with joy this is a designation for the eight spoke path of the awakened that is wise understanding wise thoughts wise speech wise actions wise living wise practice wise awareness and wise meditation monks i have reopened the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. And I have revealed and closed the deceptive path, released the decoy and removed the lure. Monks, what should be done by a teacher for his students holding their best interest at heart? Out of loving compassion, that I have done for you. There are these roots of trees, monks. There are these empty huts. There are these meditative meditators' cells in Sandun Arana Monastery. These monastic kutis. Meditate, monks. Do not be neglectful, lest you become remorseful when the time has passed after your 10-day retreat. This is my advice to you. This is what the awakened one said. With an uplifted mind, the monks delighted in the awakened one's words. So sad, sad, sad. And so on this, uh, we had a little, uh, we had a little stroll today, opening up the safe and free path to be traveled with joy. <laughs> with Bhante Sila uh, and I think this is a good reminder for us to uh, keep an uplifted mind keep it light keep your practice light have fun uh, keep smiling as much as you can you'll see it really gets to you and what one frequently thinks and dwells upon over and over again, even if it's just a smile, that will become the inclination of the mind. So smiling will become an inclination of your mind. So keep, keep having fun. Don't buy into the story of your mind when it comes up with things and it becomes serious and it thinks, Oh, why am I not able to meditate? Oh, why can I attain Nibbana? And just laugh at it. You saw the monkeys today. It's just like jumping from branch to branch. It's the same thing with the mind. It's just always worrying about something. <laughs> and so have fun. Keep it light. Sometimes when you read the sutras, it sounds like the Buddha is telling you to control your mind uh, or like tame it like an elephant. Yeah. So basically that, that largely stems from a sutta that is called Vitakka Sankhaya Sutta, it's like number 20 or tw yeah, 20. Um, where there is some kinds of uh, examples where uh, you, you would kind of like have to control the mind or things like that. Um, but really when the, the Buddha used the word taming, taming the mind is basically, he's, he's not really like, because the word taming in our minds, in our English vocabulary, <clears throat> and what the Buddha actually means, when the, when the Buddha talks about taming, it's more about training. 
So when he's talking about taming an elephant, is basically there are similes where he's talking about going to get a wild elephant in the forest and coming in and like knocking down the post on the ground and tying him to a post and then educating him basically like showing him good manners being comfortable around humans knowing how to behave how to uh, uh, you can you can even see that at the Shri Dalada Maligawa when they they train the elephants for the the Perehera uh, the the elephants can even bow they bow they bow to the temple and so just showing them uh, and it's like the mind basically showing the mind what is good conduct what is how to taming the mind is basically is basically a word taming is a word we use for like animals like training animals like he uses the thoroughbred horses uh, basically how to how you train a horse properly so that it becomes a thoroughbred it becomes a, a well a well trained horse that you can the king can mount basically so it's the same thing for the mind we're showing it the right way to behave wholesome way of behaving um, harmless ways of behaving because if if the king mounts an elephant and it just starts to trample everything around i mean that's that's not really a point and as far as controlling uh, to me and my humble understanding of all of this if there is the need to control then there is a lack of wisdom so whenever we feel like we need to control the mind that means we're not actually seeing the real nature of what's happening basically because if the mind has to be kind of really controlled then something is happening we're not letting go basically or not we're not cultivating it in the right way and so it becomes this thing where we feel like we need to push and pull and block and uh, poke our cows in line but in reality if we know which states to grow and these are just wholesome states uh, unwholesome states uh, if we know how to turn these into wholesome states then there is no need for that so yeah that's why I am careful about the word refrain uh, restrain also restrain is a word that it's like you have to use it in the right context you know it's like because in the way that it's been understood nowadays this teaching is very different so we have to really some of the words can can create some problems like that so but that's a really good question. I think I understand. I'll try to answer as, as best as I can. Um, so basically, I started with, you know, this is the Buddha's awakening. This is how he. This is a piece of it, anyways, because in the suttas, there's quite a, there's a few instances where he shares this kind of part of his own awakening. And this is one of them and um, here he's talking about these wholesome states basically as I said as I explained uh, this sutta starts with Dhamma Vichaya which basically this sutta is one of the most beautiful elaboration complete elaboration on the seven supports of awakening the Sattva Sambhojanga it's very detailed and it's fleshed out packed, uh, unpacked completely and we start with Dhamma Vichaya. And this is not only awareness and awareness that goes towards understanding states, wholesome states of mind, unwholesome states of mind, and what to do with these two. So it's one thing to know it, and then it's another thing to know what to do with them. So as, as I say in my, in my book, which is not out yet, one of them you let them go and the other ones you let them grow basically and as you do that then continually doing that uh, then that is wiriya wiriya is the continually doing this over and over again applying the six hours when your mind is distracted doesn't matter you just six hour that 
and then you can continue all the time and that is the way the mind becomes purified now when that happens then joy arises relief arises gladness arises pita pamoja and then because when one uh, realizing that these five hindrances have been abandoned within gladness arises that's what we say every day from that gladness joy arises and so that is the PT these seven supports of awakening I mean that's the awakening <laughs> it's the awakening of the Buddha why did he call the seven supports of awakening it's because that's in another sutta that's why I call them the supports of awakening he says it's the, it they're all like rafters of a peaked roof they're all leading inclining sloping towards nibbana basically towards liberation of the mind and that's why I, I call them the supports of awakening it's from that sutta because anga anga is also it can be a, a limb but it can be a support or some kind of uh, bojanga and so from there we have an elabor elaboration of the jhana so as you do this continually then the mind will progress and go through the territory of release there will be stages of release of the mind and these are the jhanas basically it's not it's not black magic or anything it's just really simple really it's it's just as you let go the this is what is going to happen to your mind that's all that means and then in the end of course he had to package his teaching in a way that people could like take it on you know if uh, if this discourse was really complicated and really long and lasted for like 12 hours explaining you know this is what you exactly have to do and you know he never has a teaching like that that is like complete like explaining everything you know that's why he taught it in many different suttas but here he explains and then you have a uh, PT and then when there's PT the body calms down the mind calms down Pasadi and then Samadhi happens because that's just the nature of the mind and then Upeka that, that balance of mind steadiness of mind uh, and in there you know he's not talking about any time time measure <laughs> so we don't know how long this lasts he just says it like this and it sounds like oh yeah I'm just gonna go back to my kuti and just like you know remember my past lives <laughs> it doesn't work like that it it takes a long time you know this is bhavana this is a wholesome mental development and so uh, this is over the course of you know uh, a 10 day retreat or you know it's it's not something that you can just be for sure I'm gonna experience that right now uh, so that's always to keep in mind and then and then he goes into okay so with that clear and bright mind that is really steady I can I remember my past lives you know he's the Buddha and so you know for him to say that and for us to get there it's two things you know? <laughs> and so there it's a, it's a big step it's a big step and but he but he still takes that step and goes to like the very end and says this is what happens and this is how the release happens in that release one knows this is release and this is the only no, it's hard for us to imagine how complete liberation feels like because our mind is just not so well positioned to understand that to to feel it the more we move towards that the more we'll start to understand because it's kind of like it starts to resonate starts resonating with that and it starts to be able to comprehend okay what's a mind without defilements even like you know there's no no anger no no nothing and so he explains he just finishes with done is what had to be done there's no more rebirth I mean this is like convoluted it's if, if we go into these topics of the past life and 
like multi-layered past lives dependent origination i mean we can be here for quite a while but <laughs> um i like to translate that bit as unwholesome states have been uh, they, they cannot be anymore there's no more arising of unwholesome states there's no more like jati kina jati there's no more rebirth but really for us it means unwholesome states basically it's a little bit closer to our experience i find then done is what had to be done uh, there is no more conceit so that mana at the end it just uh, that perception of uh, selfhood and all of that so this is quite deep what he's saying here i mean this is day two so usually i don't dive into these deep deep topics <laughs> but uh so really that is the awakening of the buddha i just like that he kind of capsul encapsulates it into this kind of digestible pill we can kind of swallow and understand have a little bit of an idea what he's talking about and then talking about the the deer the deer herd and the the, the happy the p happy path to be traveled with joy which he reopened and here you are and i'm making you smile <laughs> and develop love with your spiritual friend all the time so here we are practicing towards this beautiful liberation and awakening good okay so let us share our merits and continue on smiling may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be may the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief may all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share these merits of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu. I'm leaving home for the coastline, someplace under the sun. I feel my heart for the first time Cause now I'm moving on, yeah I'm moving on